Take a seat. Now we're back to our camp theme song, Hold the Fort. Is the Archbishop here of Penang? Not yet. Okay, let me tell you the story because some of them they don't know Archbishop. Because yesterday Pastor Wei said Archbishop because Arch is the Tope. Eh? <laughs> ah. Okay, because Bishop in the Bible also means Pastor. Yeah, so you all must go SBI. 
So there are three uh, names, uh, pastor, bishop, and elders. Means, so this one, uh, archbishop. <laughs> okay, for those of you who are thinking, how come the archbishop? Uh, uh, so it's in Chinese, duo yin, duo yi zi, uh, same pronunciation but different meaning. Ah, there comes the archbishop. <laughs> but he's very straight. He stands very straight. I learned my hiking from the archbishop. Wow, because he has trained me to be the hiker. So we form a shalom hiking group. <laughs> Let's hold the fort. Because we need to hold each other fort. So if the archbishop is needs some rest, we go and support. Hold the fort. Yes. Hold the fort. Song leading in church camp must be a bit, I mean, relaxed, uh, cannot be so rigid, uh, so faster, okay? <laughs> more, more fun. <laughs> okay, the next song we're going to praise the Lord is This So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. So, how do we trust in Jesus? I was thinking this word trust. We totally rely on upon Savior and Surrender to Him, to trust. Totally rely upon Saviour, our Saviour. This is so sweet to trust in Jesus. May this hymn be also just like yesterday we, we were reminded the first love, the first love we have for Jesus. May this song remind us to rekindle our first love for Jesus.
I'm very thankful for the, the next song that I learned in Shalom. It's like a love song to the Lord as we go through trials and tribulations in our lives. So I pray that may this song also inspire those of us who are going through trials and maybe difficult time because the Lord has planned for you. Because he has every purpose for every trials. He doesn't make any mistake. He uses the trials to train, to mold you as we trust in the Lord. Let us rejoice as we encounter tribulations, joy and trials in our lives. Rejoice in the Lord.
And the next, <coughs> the next hymn, I think, is a rather Chris' favorite song. And this song actually also reminds us the meaning of Christmas. So instead of singing uh, the usual secular Christian uh, music, we can actually use this song to minister to those who yet to know Christ. Because Christ has come to die for our sin. And what a beautiful hymn that is born to die. Jesus come for us. I'll hand the time to Brother Chris. I'll save the next one perhaps for the closing. And to the camp commandant, Brother Eric. 
Thank you, Brad Howard, for leading the song, and uh, Sister Adeline for playing the piano, and Daniel, the guitar, right? Right, uh, yesterday night, how? How's your sleep? Okay? My wife said that I go back and knock out, but I wake up twice in the middle of the night. But thank God for the good night rest. I think I'm old already, 50 years old, next year 51. No more young, that's why now I'm taking care of the children, but children don't make me run too much, okay? <laughs> Later, this old uncle will fall down. Yeah. Uh, all of you all feeling well? No fever, cough. Uh, if you all have any symptom, you can come to me because I have this. If you need mask, you can come to me because I have mask. All right? If you need it. Uh, okay, today I just run through a quick program with you before I hand over time to Brother Chris. Okay, after the lesson, we have a discussion until about 11. We have indoor games until about 12. We have lunch at 12. Then at 2 o'clock, please. Uh, okay, I'm still checking whether we can use the field. They were saying that actually, if you want to use the field, we need a book and you need this pay some money. So I'm not quite sure at this point in time whether we can use it. Right, but I will text to tell you where to gather. Most likely it'll be here if we are not going out there to play. Right? If not, you'll be there. So please look out for the text that will be coming up. Uh, we'll finish the game about maybe 4, 4.30 or earlier. It depends on how it goes. And after that, you can have your free time uh, until about 6, have dinner. Then we'll come back here at 7.30 uh, for our singing lesson and relationship building time. Right, so that's the program for the day. Uh, anyone have any question for me before I hand the time over to Brother Chris? No, yeah, Brother Chris. Good morning. Yeah, it's always thankful for the opportunity that I can stand before the church to share the word of God. And uh, before I start, I just want to acknowledge the team behind, like the team in front, Sean, Asher, and uh, Caleb. Uh, trust me that they put in a lot of effort to make this running. And we are running a live streaming, you know, for all for for the seven lessons. If you see all this cable. Please keep away from the cable. Or any of you touch the cable, we may not have a third lesson. So yeah, give thanks to this team of people working behind. Okay, today we're going to continue our lesson on the seven churches. I'm not sure about you. I'm certainly very looking forward to uh, the lesson on the seven churches. Uh, because we are all, in some way we heard about the seven churches. But we have heard the most about Ephesus the first church, you know, we all know about the first love, the loss of the first love. But if I were to ask you, what is the second church? What is the third church? You, know, you probably can't tell me what's the name of the second church and the third church and the fourth and so, so on. Uh, myself included, you know, I, 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 have, I have studied the first church, but I didn't go beyond the first church. So thanks to this church that we are given the opportunity to study these seven churches, I'm certainly uh, looking forward to uh, this lesson and even the rest of the lessons. Okay, uh, without further ado, I will just do a quick intro. Uh, the second church is Smyrna, just in case that you don't know, it's Smyrna. I always thought it's Smyrna because M-Y, uh, but subsequently uh, after I learned about uh, the name, the meaning, the root word of the, of the uh, Smyrna, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm corrected, huh? it is uh, Smyrna. And uh, the text that we're going to cover is from Revelation chapter 2, 8 to 11. Only four verses. Yeah, if you have your Bible, let's, let's turn to Revelation chapter 2. We'll read this together. May I request the, uh, the congregation to stand? Revelation chapter 2, verse 8 to 11. 
I will start with eight and then you do nine, I, I do 10 and we do 11 together. Okay, if you are ready, the Revelation chapter two, verse eight. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Verse 10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil will cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulations ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, once again for allowing us to come together for this church camp and uh, the privilege, Lord, to open the last book of the Bible, Revelation, and to study the letters to the seven churches. Lord, we seek your blessing as we examine these uh, seven churches and to learn about uh, the lessons. Uh, more importantly, Lord, uh, help us to even, uh, through these uh, writings, able to uh, understand you, able to understand your character. And may with this uh, awareness of uh, your character, Lord, we are able to uh, march forward, Lord, for your own glory. We commit the rest of the church, uh, the, rest, the rest of the camp unto your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please take a seat. I will just do a very quick intro. The, the letters to the church in Smyrna is the second letters among the seven is written to Smyrna. Uh, again, if you are not familiar with the church Smyrna, after this camp, you will be pretty familiar. It is the second letter to the second church. Uh, coincidentally, there's a lot of second, there's a lot of two uh, as we go through the lesson together. And Smyrna is mentioned only twice, only two times in the Bible, and it's in Revelation chapter 1, verse 11, and uh, chapter 2, verse 8. So it's a pretty uh, unknown church. Many of us may not even know that uh, the, the church uh, Smyrna exists until you come to uh, Revelation. Uh, the letter to Smyrna is the shortest letters of all the seven letters. As we have just read, it only has four verses. Only has four verses. So the lesson will be quite short. Verse 8 tells us who is the recipient of this letter, the angel of the church. It's written to the angel of the church. And then the author, the author is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The main messages targeted at Smyrna uh, are in verse 9 and verse 10. That will be our focus for today's lesson. Verse 9 and verse 10. And verse 11, it says, the, it's the closing of this letter tells us the messages in this letter are meant for all the churches. As Pastor Christian mentioned yesterday, uh, these seven letters to the seven churches is throughout all ages. You know, every ages you find this same set of uh, needs, this same set of problems that we, have, we will be facing. So it's intended for all churches, it's intended for everyone that can hear. It's intended for you and for me. And more importantly, I want to say again, in all our reading, uh, I've been sharing this with a lot of young people, in all our reading in the Bible, do not miss that we are trying to study and understand Christ himself, the character of God. It is, you know, in, in our reading, we should see that reading the Bible is more than just finding a solution uh, to our problem or finding something to apply, to do. Uh, but more importantly, to know God himself. Uh, that should be our, our desire when we read the Bible. And I also put this up just in case you don't know. This is our theme verse. If you flip to chapter 4 of our camp booklet, it's a team verse. It's the last verse of uh, the seven letters. But you will find this, this phrase appeared seven times because it ends with uh, every church, it ends with this. He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Unto the churches. So pay attention to hear what the message has for every one of us. As usual, we will start with a video. I want you to pay attention to 
the video give a very good overview the history of Smyrna things that are not written in the Bible but there were uh, research put on uh, to study actually when I look at the video I'm very impressed huh? they have a team of people to do the video uh, we may take 20 minutes to finish it uh, but trust me that this video probably take weeks or even months to come together uh, so, so enjoy uh, the, the hard work put in uh, the, the, the president of Cornerstone uh, University, I think it's Joseph Joe, uh, he will explain the name of Smyrna in the video and he will, he will spend a bit of time on tribulations uh, because this is a church that suffers. It's a suffering church. Suffer not because they have any wrongdoing, not because they have committed anything wrong, not because you know, they are bad. But that they suffer because they stand for the Lord. They stand for their faith. They suffer for that. So we talk about tribulation, poverty, slander, imprisonment. You know, we add them together to talk about these tribulations. Interestingly, as we read the, the four verses, despite all this suffering, uh, the Bible says, but thou art rich. But thou art rich. Why? Why all the suffering end up with, you know, but thou art rich? So he will give us some explanation. And there's also this mention about 10 days. And what is this 10 days talking about? Uh, we will hear something from this video. And then uh, the crown of life is a reward uh, waiting for all those who will stand firmly in the Lord. It's a reward given to those who stand firmly. Not a reward for everyone, but for those who stand firmly in the Lord. Okay, before we go any further, we can play the video. On this day of discovery, author and Cornerstone University President Joe Stoll explores a land rich in biblical history, modern Turkey, and the city of Izmir. Here lie the excavations from the ancient city of Smyrna. In the first century, Smyrna was a thriving port city of the Roman Empire. And in this community, a group of Jesus followers came together as a church one of seven churches addressed in the beginning of the book of Revelation, written by the Apostle John, once the young disciple of Jesus Christ. Revelation is a book that for many speaks of a terrible future for the world and mankind, culminating with judgment and God's wrath being poured out on the earth. But this final revelation of Jesus Christ unveils far more than a final world war and cosmic destruction. It also reveals a yet future time of restoration and peace, a time when suffering and tears will cease. The book begins by revealing the heart of the resurrected Jesus for those he's left behind, with seven personal letters to seven first century churches that stood in contrast to their culture, located within the borders of what we know today as modern Turkey. The second letter is to the Church of Smyrna. Journey to the Seven Churches of Revelation, the letter to Smyrna, on this day of discovery. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke, and having turned, 
I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. We're standing amongst the ruins of ancient Smyrna, which as you can see is tucked right into the middle of the thriving Turkish city of Izmir. But Smyrna in its day was a thriving city as well. In fact, Smyrna was known as one of the finest seaports in the world. Uh, if you were to take a straight line west from Smyrna, it was the closest seaport to Europe. In fact, you'd end up right in Athens, the gateway to the rest of Europe. So Smyrna was an important city in its day. Smyrna was known for its beauty and its architecture and its gorgeous flowers in this almost tropical climate. But Smyrna was known for something else. Uh, its citizens took pride in its history. In 600 BC, the Lydian King Attalus conquered Smyrna and actually devastated it, left it as a humble, tiny village. And then when Alexander the Great came through here, in a dream he had a vision to rebuild Smyrna and rebuilt it into one of the most spectacular cities of its day. So the folklore and all of its literature was filled with references to death and resurrection. That we are the city who once was dead and have now come to life. And it's that theme that Jesus Christ picks up on when he writes his letter to early Christians suffering in this city. This claim to fame that Smyrna was that city that once was dead but has been resurrected now to a far better life was underscored by their major commodity. Smyrna held the exclusive rights to the import and export of the valued fragrant spice called myrrh. Actually, hence their name, Smyrna. Myrrh was not only valued for its fragrance, but it was valued for its use in burial procedures. In fact, they sold just countless amounts of myrrh to Egypt, when the embalming process was to preserve the body for its right to the afterlife, and myrrh was a very key ingredient. You know, I wonder if when the wise men came to celebrate the birth of Christ, that the frankincense and myrrh that they brought, I wonder if that came from Smyrna. And I think too of the death of Christ, where they wrapped him and anointed him with myrrh. That probably came from Smyrna as well. So no wonder Jesus camps on this theme, that early Christians who just may face death for him would be resurrected to a far better life. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that Jesus opens his letter by saying, I am the first and the last, the one who has died and risen again. And then he says to them, I know your tribulation. Interesting how all of the letters begin with that phrase, I know. In Revelation chapter 1, in John's vision, Christ is seen as walking amongst the lampstands, saying that he is present with the churches. But he's not just present. He's intensely aware of what they're dealing with. And he says, I know what tribulation you're under. The word tribulation there is the word for an ancient torture where they would take the victim and lie him on his back and then put weights on his chest, one upon another upon another until those weights began to crush 
and make it so he couldn't breathe anymore. What a vivid picture. Jesus recognizes three weights on the chest of this church. Number one, their poverty. Number two, they're slandered as a subculture by the Jews in this town. And number three, he predicts that they will face imprisonment and even death. It's kind of a foreboding warning, I would say. But at the end of the letter, he encourages them to persevere. Let's think about that challenge, that weight of their poverty. Taking a stand for Jesus Christ in the Roman Empire, and particularly here in Smyrna, often meant being cast into an impoverished state. Um, you may lose your job. You'd certainly be kicked out of the trade unions because you wouldn't worship the gods of the trade unions. Uh, you're such a despised minority that even if you set up a little kiosk somewhere to sell your wares, that who'd want to buy from Christians? So Jesus says to the believers in Smyrna, I know your tribulation and your poverty. But then he does something interesting, parentheses. He says, but you are rich. Fascinating. It's all in the definitions, isn't it? You know, we think being truly rich is to have a big stack of stuff and a huge bank account. <laughs> God says, that's not true riches. And he says that in their poverty, they're rich. It reminds me of my all-time favorite story about Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 12, when he's walking through the crowd and there's a man in the crowd who catches the eyes of Christ and what a privilege. Now Jesus, this magnet rabbi, looks at him and he gets to talk to him. And he says to Jesus, Master, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. You know, I'm thinking, like, if you get one shot at Jesus, that's probably not a good thing to say. I think if I had one shot at him, I'd want to say something so profound that he would say, hmm, I never thought of that. <laughs> Let's have dinner and talk it over. But Jesus responded to the man in the crowd by making an amazing statement. He said, take heed and beware of greed, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things that he possesses. Think that through. So counterculture that our lives do not consist of earthly riches. Then he told the story of a rich fool who had so much that he had to tear down his barns and build bigger barns through a party for himself, and God showed up and said, this night thy soul shall be required of you. And he wasn't a fool because he had a lot of stuff. Jesus said he was a fool because he was not rich toward God. I think the believers in Smyrna were rich toward God, though they were in poverty. Of course, being impoverished because one doesn't deny the name of Jesus Christ was not limited just to the believers at Smyrna. In fact, throughout all of history, that's often been the case. In our own lifetime, believers in Russia were marginalized and impoverished as a church. I remember being in Russia with a friend of mine who was a pastor of a little local assembly. And he said to me one day, hey, let's go visit my mom. So we climbed in the van and we drove about an hour and drove off the main highway down a smaller road, then onto a dirt road, and a couple miles back that dirt road was this little shanty town, little huts almost. He pulled up in front of one of them, and his mom, who was a widow, came running out to see us in her babushka, reddened face, smiling and rejoicing. I thought it was to see my friend Victor. But as we walked into her little house, it only had two rooms. Um, I walked by the garden that she had planted and noticed she had a pig in the sty over there. And I said, oh, your mom's got a pig. He said, yep. She raises that in the summer and eats it in the winter. This woman had nothing. And we went in and sat down around a little primitive table and she served us some vegetables. And she was just beaming. And all she could talk about wasn't Victor, <laughs> about Jesus and about how much she loved him and how much he meant to her and how she couldn't wait to get to heaven, to be with him forever. And I kind of felt so convicted. You know, here, like most of us, I have a lot. You know, affluence has just filled up my cup. And here this woman had nothing. 
but I thought she's got everything. And I thought, all she had was Jesus. <laughs> and that made her truly rich. And that was like the believers in Smyrna. All they had was Jesus, but that made them truly rich. And then I thought, I have so much that there are times I wonder if I need Jesus. And that makes me truly poor. So when Jesus said to the believers in Smyrna, you are poor, but you are rich, what a wonderful statement and what a wonderful lesson for us to learn. Underneath the uh, plateau of the excavations here in the city of Smyrna are these caverns and arches and rooms, which are all a part of the ongoing excavation of this ancient city. In fact, you may hear some clanging and banging in the background as the work proceeds. But being down here reminds me of the second weight of tribulation that was placed on the early church in this ancient city. As Jesus said, I know not just your poverty, but that you are slandered by the Jews of the synagogue of Satan. This made life very tough for the early Christians, this slander. It gives whole new meaning to that. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me, because these names really hurt the early Christians. Uh, the Jews wanted to be distanced from the church. The Jews, interestingly enough, had a cover with the Roman Empire. Uh, they had an exemption from claiming that Caesar was Lord, since their one God was the God of Israel. Um, these early Christians threatened that exemption because they were trouble for Rome. So they wanted to kick the Christians out of the synagogue. And in so doing, they slandered their name. So the slander was that these Christians had orgies in their gatherings. Um, they, they said that at these love feasts, they ate the body of Christ and drank his blood in communion. So the slander was that these early Christians were cannibalistic in their feasts. They called each other brother and sister. So the slander was that they were anti-family. In the structure of Rome, the family was very important, that these were people who did not care about their families, just about each other. Well, it was those kinds of things that caused additional pressure, that marginalized the Christians, that alienated them, that made them a despised subculture. And so Jesus says, I'm well aware of your tribulation and the great weight of the slander that is thrown against you. So Jesus writes to these suffering followers of him at Smyrna that he knows the weights of their tribulation, that he knows the weight of their poverty, uh, the weight of the slander hurled against them. And then he announces that there is a third weight yet to come. He tells them that their faith will be tested because they will be thrown into prison and some of them would die for his namesake. <laughs> it wasn't good news. I mean, there were no like executive prisons or nice places where they locked up Christians. But to be imprisoned probably meant that you would be thrown into a rat-infested dungeon full of human excrement, very little light, and certainly not much food. And to die? Well, you'd be thrown to the wild beasts in a public arena while the crowds cheered, or you'd be burned at the stake, or some other horrific way to die. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened to these believers. In fact, some of the famous martyrs of the church were martyred here in Smyrna. The most famous of them was Polycarp, the bishop of the second century church. Uh, Polycarp lived long and uh, distributed scriptures. He guarded the church against heresy. He's one, one of our most famous heroes. He had a dream one night in his older age of his pillow catching fire, and he told his friends the next day, that he thought that was God warning him about being burned at the stake for his faith. 
And sure enough, the proconsul of this area of the Roman Empire sent guards a few days later to get Polycarp and bring him before the proconsul. Polycarp welcomed them in and he had his servants prepare a meal for them. He said, just wait, let me feed you. And he said, could I have one hour to pray? And he went apart and prayed for an hour. And in that prayer, there was so much energy and passion that the guards heard it and their hearts became guilty for why would we, why would we extinguish a life in a man like this? But faithful to their duty, they hauled him before the Roman leader. The Roman leader, looking at this old man himself, wonders, how can I put this man to death? And he pleads with Polycarp to deny his faith. And Polycarp made that famous statement. He said, I have served my master for 80 and six years. How can I now deny his name? So the proconsul, in anger, said, I'm going to throw you to the wild beasts. He said, you can do whatever you want. I will not deny Jesus Christ. So they stacked up the wood and made a stake to burn Polycarp to death. Normally, they would nail people to the stake so they wouldn't move. Polycarp said, you don't need to do that. Just tie my hands. I will not move. And they lit the fire. Legend has it that a wind came along and literally swept the fire away from Polycarp like a sail full of wind and he didn't die and so the guard commanded one to go and stab Polycarp and indeed they did and he died there for Jesus Christ just as Christ predicted would happen but Jesus added a little note in the letter he said these tribulations will only last for 10 days which was a metaphor in those days of just a short time and then he said, after these are over, I have something special for you. See, I think life is a lot like a feature-length film. Uh, we freeze frame it in Smyrna with the poverty and the slander, the imprisonment and the death of these Christians. If that's all you have, you're in total despair. Why wouldn't you deny the name of Christ? Oh, but there's more. And Jesus Christ is the executive producer. And at the end of the film, there is great reward. And Jesus adds that at the end of the letter. So Jesus is the executive producer of the feature length film. I don't know what we'd call it, maybe like suffering in Smyrna. But in each one of these letters, he gives these Christians a sneak preview of what is to come, of the end of the film, the end game. And to the believers at Smyrna, he says, to those of you who overcome, or to those of you who endure, I will give you a crown of life. That was a very significant statement for people in Smyrna because the crown was the symbol of the city of Smyrna. Probably taken from the fact that up on the Acropolis overlooking the city were their embattlements and it was in the shape of a crown. So the crown was on their coins. Uh, crowns in those days were what people got if they won a victory in the games. Or at great festivities, everybody would wear a garland of a crown. A crown is what emperors wore. And these Christians had no crowns. And they were never involved in the festivities. They never won the games. Certainly, they weren't in the emperor's court. The fact that they never wore crowns was a visible symbol of their disenfranchisement with society. But Jesus said, hang in there, and at the end, I will give you a crown of life. And they did hang in there. For them, it was not game over. For them, it was game on. Here we come. And I think they must have believed what Paul wrote, Paul himself a martyr, when he said, for me to live is Christ, and to die, oh, that will be gain. And so Jesus told them, overcome, and great is your reward in heaven. You know, I guess it would be easy to look at these letters like, these were believers living in a far different world 2,000 years ago. 
But one thing that strikes me as I study these letters is how relevant they are to us today. Take, for instance, the church at Ephesus. They stood tall. They did not compromise in the midst of all of that pressure. And they had a great church. But the problem was they did, did all the church things and functioned in church world for all the wrong reasons. It wasn't because they loved Jesus Christ and that this was their opportunity to worship Christ in their work and that the love of Christ motivated them to do this. You know how easy it is for us to get caught up in that, like I'm a deacon, I'm an elder, I sing in a worship team, I do the drama, uh, I welcome people, I do small groups, it's just my obligation, it's my duty, I'm a Christian, these are the kind of things that I do. Well, if you read the letter to Ephesus, Jesus is not impressed with that. <laughs> in fact, he says, I'll take the power of your church away if it's just a duty and habit and project, and if your work for me is not an act of worship and a response of love. So we've got to go to school on that. Maybe the reason why so many of our churches seem to be so powerless is because we're doing church for all the wrong reasons. That could be. Or I think of the church at Smyrna and the pressure that they were under. I think they're, of their impoverishment, for instance. You know, there are people today who decide they are not going to break their commitment to Jesus Christ and to his kind of integrity to keep their job. Because they don't cheat on contracts, because they don't go to the strip clubs with their friends on trips, because they refuse to compromise their commitment to Jesus Christ. Sometimes they're demoted, sometimes they lose their job. It's easy for us to become alienated today for our stand for the cause of Christ in the marketplace, isn't it? It's a lot of pressure, but will you stand? I even think of the slander. Uh, interestingly, our world, the Western world, is moving kind of into this neo-paganism, very similar to the world in which these early Christians live, where our claim for Christ, that he is the only way, our stand for life, our stand for human sexuality has pushed us to the margins. And we're often called names and despised and rejected because of that. Christians at Smyrna took their stand because they knew great was their reward in heaven. I think even of Christians all over the world today who are imprisoned for Jesus Christ. We've kind of gotten a hall pass on that kind of thing in the West, but there are literally tens of thousands of Christians right now, as you and I are watching this, who are suffering imprisonment for Christ. And many who are paying the price of martyrdom. So this is not old school stuff. This is extremely relevant. It's the same Jesus who lives today, lives in our hearts, lives in our midst, that would write letters exactly like this to us. We'll all have to answer the question personally. Are we willing to stand, knowing that great is our reward in heaven? You notice you wear a shirt with two pockets. I purposely wear a two pocket. So we are connected. <laughs> okay, let's come back to our lesson proper. Uh, uh, I'll do that. We have went through the video presentations. Okay, now we dive dive into the words. Eh? Yeah, please uh, turn to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. We're going to go through these uh, four verses together. Verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, which, is, which was dead and is alive. I underline uh, you know, the angel, the first and uh, the last, and death and alive. Because I want to talk a bit more. I was saying that this letter is written to the angel of the church. Who is the angel of the church? The angel, if you go back to the root word, it means the messenger. The messengers of the church. 
So in this case, it is written to the pastor of the church. You know, many times, uh, God speaks to us through the pastor. Obviously, when the pastor receives this letter for Smyrna, you know, after he has uh, received it, he's supposed to teach the church. He's supposed to explain, expound, and teach the church about it. So, you know, so, so God usually uses the pastor, and pastor is given the responsibility to teach the congregation, go through him and, and teach us. So the word angel actually refers to the pastor of the church. And the first, the first and the last, and which was dead and alive, obviously is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, if you just look to Revelation chapter 1, uh, verse 17, you know, again, the Bible sort of uh, explains itself. 17, is, it, it says here, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. So the Lord Jesus Christ is the one uh, who, who, who wrote this. You look at the verse, it say, And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith, saith who? Saith the Lord Jesus Christ. Saith the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and the word uh, Smyrna, as we have heard earlier, it has to do with the root word, Murph. And uh, interestingly, if you if you do a, a concordant search, the, the, the Greek word is G4666. And if you do a search, it only appears in the Bible two times. Only appears in the Bible two times. Now, I, I'm not sure you are, you, are, you are surprised. We heard of the Murph, you know, many times. But actually, it only appears in the Bible two times, uh, G4666. And the first mention is in chapter uh, Matthew chapter 2. 11. Let's go to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew 2, 11. I'll read to you. Yeah. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Uh, who are these people who presented? If you look at verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the day of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. So this event is about when Jesus was born, the wise men from the east, you know, come and look for Jesus. And they bring along this thing called myrrh. That was the first mention of myrrh. In, in, in the New Testament, in the New Testament. And then the last mention, let's turn to John, chapter 19. Let's go to John, chapter 19. I read to you, 39. And there came also Nicodemus, which... At the first came to Jesus by night. At the first came to Jesus by night is referring to the first time Nicodemus, you know, came to Jesus by night. He asked him, Master, you know, you must be from God. This, this was the Nicodemus, which at first came to Jesus by night and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloe, about a hundred pound weight. So this was talking about the death. Verse 40, okay. Then, look they, then took they the body of Jesus and wounded it in linen cloth with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bear it. Oh, interestingly, Merv was mentioned two times in the Bible, and the first mention was Jesus was born. And the last mention was Jesus, you know, burial. Uh, it's, you know, when you look at uh, uh, this Smyrna as a name, uh, it, it is how, how dearly uh, the Lord keep the, the church murder is they are with him from the start until the end. If, if I'm a member of a church of Smyrna, you know, it's given such great uh, privilege that you know, I was with the Lord from the start until the end. You know? So I hope you remember the name Smyrna. Smyrna. Let's go to verse 9. Back to Revelation. 
chapter 2 verse 9. But the verse says, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. I want to focus on the word, uh, I know thy works. I know thy works in this context is supposed to bring comfort, supposed to give encouragement uh, for the Smyrna, for the members of Smyrna to know that the Lord Jesus, I know thy works. And uh, I know thy works mentioned seven times in these seven letters. Uh, when, when you study the Bible, the Bible repeats itself. It means that something that, that the Lord wants you to pay attention. And in this case, it's mentioned seven times at the beginning of every letter. At the beginning of every letter, the Lord says, I know thy works. You just go there quickly. If you look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 2, uh, it was to the letter, to the church in uh, Ephesus, he said, I know thy works. And for Smyrna, in verse 9, he said, I know thy works. In verse 13, I know thy works. Verse 19, I know thy works. Chapter 3, verse 1 in the middle, I know thy works. Verse 8, chapter 3, I know thy works. And uh, verse 15, I know thy works. Uh, if there's one thing that you, you can take away from the seven churches, the letters to the seven churches, I hope you remember that the Lord knows. The Lord knows thy works. Uh, when the Lord says, I know thy works, it means that I am all knowing. And uh, you can be sure that he is all present. I know we say about omniscient, omnipresent. Uh, you know, he, he is all powerful, all knowing and all present. So when he say, I know thy works, it should bring great comfort to every one of us. And, and in this case, he say, I know thy works uh, and tribulation and poverty. Again, I want to say that it's emphasizing on uh, the church in Smyrna for their for their suffering, that the Lord knows everything. And he said, but thou art rich. Uh, if you are rich in the Lord, uh, there's something that you all should desire to be. Uh, we should be rich in the Lord and not rich in the world. And there's a second I know. There's a second I know. Let me see. Uh. So I said, I know that word means comfort and encouragement. Uh, the second I know say that I know the blasphemy of them which, which say they are Jew and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Uh, the Lord also knows those who are not his, those who play, uh, play to be uh, uh, the Lord's children, but they are not. And uh, when you heard, I know, beside comfort and encouragement, it can also mean shame and reproach. Uh, for those who purposefully reject, purposefully deny the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, it, can, it can mean Shame and reproach. Uh, let's turn to Second Timothy two nineteen. Second Timothy two nineteen. I'm using my hard copy, huh? so take over. Huh? Second Timothy two nineteen. I'll read to you. Uh, it says here, nevertheless. The foundation of God's standards were having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Uh, the verse tells us that the Lord knoweth who those who are his. You know, uh, if you have been calling the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior, the, the second part of the verse says, Let everyone that nameth the name of the Lord and the name of Jesus depart from iniquity. Or let us all depart. From iniquity because the Lord knows everything. The Lord knows your thoughts. The Lord knows why you are here. The Lord knows why you are serving. The Lord knows why you are not serving. The Lord knows everything. And uh, second Peter 2 9. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 9. Second Peter chapter two verse nine. I'll read to you. Yeah. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment, 
to be punished. So I was saying that, you know, uh, yeah, the Lord know how to deliver those who are faithful. The Lord know how to deliver if you are standing firm in Him. So be not worried. The Lord knows everything. Uh, lastly, on this same point, uh, it's First Peter verse 4, chapter 4. Verse 12 to 14. It reads, Beloved, think it's not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. You know, do you think it's strange that uh, believers going through testing, going through uh, trial and temptation? Or the verse tells us that, you know, don't, don't think that it is strange. We, we should go through they say, believe it, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in as much as ye are partaker of Christ's sufferings, that when his suffer shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Indeed, if we can partake, if we can be part of the, the, the suffering, if we can be if we can suffer for the Lord for standing firm, it's such, a, it's such an honor and privilege. Now, I, I guess some of the young people here, is, sometimes it's quite difficult for you to uh, exercise uh, some of this uh, teaching in the Bible. For example, I think in the school, uh, they, are, they are beginning to accept this LGBT thing. You know? Even teachers are you know, very open to all these things. So as, as, as a student, as a, as a Christian, as a believer of, of Jesus Christ, you know, uh, when you make a stand, uh, I'm quite certain that you will be, you know, you will be looked at uh, very differently. And, uh, but you have to make the stand. So remember that. Count it, you know, a privilege and honor to stand firm, to tell the world that what is, you know, what is right and what is wrong, even though you, you have to suffer for that. Huh? Verse 13 says, But rejoice! In as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye for the spirit of glory and the God rested upon you. And on their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. You know, let us stand firm for of the Lord. I know thy work. I know thy work in this context is really to bring comfort to the saints and bring encouragement to the saints um, that you are on track. You are on track. I know thy work. Verse 10. Fear not of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried and ye shall have tribulation ten days be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. The Lord said, fear none. Fear none means don't be afraid. Or don't, don't be hindered. Continue to, to press forward. Fear none. Uh, yeah, you know, fear none, obviously, to me, is another encouragement. Fear none because, uh, because uh, you are on the right path continue to press forward. And interestingly, the Lord never say that I will remove the suffering. But he said, fear none. He said, fear none. Uh, when I look at the word fear none, I'm reminded of Joshua, Joshua 1.9. Eh? Let's turn to Joshua 1.9. In the Old Testament. Joshua 1.9. Uh, this is one of my favorite books. Last church came I was also talking about Joshua. Okay, Joshua 1 9. If you are there, Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. He said, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. You know, when, when, this, when the Lord said, Fear none, uh, I was saying that you know, it reminded me of uh, the, the command given to Joshua. You know, be strong and of a good courage. You know, because uh, he say, I for the Lord thy God is with thee whether soever thou goest. So you are not alone when the when the Lord says fear none. 
In fact, fear none come to me as a as a command, as a command to march forward. Fear none. And interestingly, he said, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. He continued to say, Behold, behold, pay attention. The devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation than this. Or oh, the, the Lord lists list down what are the things that is coming. Or oh, instead of uh, uh, saying that I will remove them, but I say he lists forward what is what is coming. Uh, he's upfront about what the uh, the members, the church in Smyrna have to go through. But nonetheless, his order was what? Fear none and uh, to, to move forward. Next, let's take a look at Romans chapter 8. Recently, in our Bible study, we went through Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 is about uh, following the Spirit. Romans 8, 14 to 18. 14 to 18. I'll read to you. Romans 8, chapter 14. It says, For as much as ye led, are led by the Spirit of God, ye are the sons of God. You know, for all of us who call the Lord Jesus Christ, we are the child of God. Huh? We are the children of God. We are the sons of God. 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Verse 17. And if children, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. If you are children, you are the heirs of God. You, are, you know. And then it says what? Join heirs with Christ. If so, be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified with him. You know, as, as chapter 8 brings us to the point that we are the child of God, join us, and then he tells us that it, it is expected, expected that you are supposed to go through what? Suffering. If so, be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified with him. And verse 18, he say, I for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So if you think through uh, the, the suffering that we go through, it is by, it is about a small small time frame compared to the eternal glory. Again, this, this verse uh, tells us that it is expected that a child of God, if you stand firmly for the Lord, you, know, you will go through suffering. Uh, but nonetheless, this is but a short time. Next, we go back to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. 2 Timothy 3, 12. It says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know, Paul wrote this to Timothy. Or he said, All, oh, everyone, that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So do not be uh, surprised that we have to go through persecution. But I'm also aware, uh, because we are living in a, a, a country with so much, you know, so affluence, uh, how are we going to be connected to suffering? Or in fact, to even feel hunger, some of our kids may not have tasted hunger. So, so suffering is a, is, is a very distant thing. It's an alien concept to many of us. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the, the, the Bible says that, uh, the Bible say that perilous time will come, you know, uh, we will all have to go through difficult time. Uh, the world will, will reject the teaching because the, the world is cursed, the world is corrupted. It is only natural that they cannot, they cannot accept uh, the teaching of God. So as a child of God, we should expect a difficult time ahead, persecution ahead. And, and this letter tells us, fear none, fear none, keep, keep moving forward. Fear none, well, with God on our side, we should be fearless. Or we, should, we should be fearless, nothing to fear. 
Chapter 2 verse 10 uh, didn't end with fear none because there's another part that says, Be thou faithful unto death. Not only fear none, it says, Be thou prepared to die for the Lord. Be thou prepared to die for the Lord. Again, uh, this verse uh, is a command and confidence to march forward. Now, some of you may, may think that, uh, Brother Chris, this is not a command. This is but a uh, recommendation or a suggestion. I have this to share, share with you. Uh, I shared this once. You know, when, when I was a young uh, uh, in the Navy, uh, when my CEO said, Chris, I suggest that you do this. To me, that is a command. Oh, to me, it's very obvious. It, it is a command. So if you think that this is a suggestion, if the Lord Jesus gives you a suggestion, take it as a command. Don't argue. You know? So we are given a command to fear none and be thou faithful unto death. Let's take a look at uh, Matthew. Matthew chapter 10. Verse 28. Matthew 10. Verse 28. I'll read to you. 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, don't worry about death, because all of us have to go through. Or the first step, the fear. So no, no worries, even if you have to stand faithful and to face death. And uh, Philippians 121, the famous saying of Paul. Huh? Some of you may know what this is. Philippians 121. Paul, you know, in his own, yeah, in his own words, he say. Uh, in Philippians 121, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To live is Christ, but to die is gain. And uh, lastly, let's turn to 2 Timothy again. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 10, 12. Again, this is a writing from Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul. To Timothy, he said in verse 10, he said, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions which come unto me at Antioch and Iconium and at uh, Lesra, which what persecution I endured. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. You know, uh, Timothy have observed the, the testimony, the example of, of Paul, how he has stand firm, went through persecution and affliction. But at the end, he say, I endure, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. You know, the Lord is with him as well. Again, in verse 12, he say, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But he himself is an example. The, the teaching of this, Be thou faithful unto death, it is, an, it is not a new teaching. If you look at the Old Testament, we have, uh, is it Daniel and the three friends? Daniel, huh? yeah, Daniel and the three friends, uh, they, they are without faithful uh, unto death. Uh, if you look at the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, for, you know, he was born to die. He was faithful to his mission and he went up to the cross. Without faithful unto death. If you look at the twelve apostles, many of them, many of them, be thou faithful unto death. Uh, the first martyr mentioned in the New Testament, he was a, a deacon, Stephen. Be thou faithful unto death. So it is not a new teaching, but we are reminded that uh, we are called to be faithful unto death. Lastly, okay, so uh, fear none. And be thou faithful unto death, it is a command for believers to faithfully march forward. Lastly, Revelation 2.10, uh, uh, oh, still at 10, uh, uh, still at uh, verse 10, uh, it says, 
and I will give thee a crown of life. I will give thee a crown of life, a reward awaiting for those who are faithful. So we should be looking forward, looking forward to meet the Lord because he said, you know, I have a crown. But, but this crown is not for everyone. This crown is not for everyone. Why? Uh, and, I, and I do a quick search on the crown of life. It's only mentioned again two times, uh, two times in the Bible. Uh, the first mention is in James chapter 1, 12. And then the last mention is uh, Revelation 2, 10. I will, I will do a comparison between these two verses. A crown of life is a commentation. You know, I try to find CCC. They say comfort, it's a command, and then it's a commentation. I was reminded of Zacchaeus, and I tried to find DDD. <laughs> okay, the crown of life is mentioned two times in the Bible. Uh, the first mention is James chapter 1, verse 12. It says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for he for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord had promised to them that love him. I was saying it's not for everyone, but for them that endure temptation, try and them that love him. If you put Revelation and, uh, and James uh, together, these two verses, I underline all the things that is associated with the crown of life. Endure of temptation is tried. Thou shalt suffer. Prison, be tried, tribulations, and death. So you see, the crown of life is not for everyone, but for those who, who suffer. But instead of uh, focusing on, on the suffering part to receive the crown of life, uh, if you pay attention to those that receive the crown of life, the Lord says in James 1, 12, blessed, blessed is the man. Well, let's endeavor to be the man that the is blessed to receive the crown of life. And the Lord said, these are the people that love him. Okay, let's endeavor to be the men that love the Lord and to await the crown of life. Fear none, we are the one that is fearless. Or with the Lord on your side, there's nothing to fear. Or with his precept, we can march forward without going left or right. You know, just, just stay on course. Fear none. Faithful, faithful was mentioned. No? We all look, to, look forward to the day when we meet the Lord. The Lord said, you are a good and faithful servant. And with all this, the Lord said, I will give thee, I will give thee the crown of life. So instead of focusing on all the negative, I, I hope we can also see the positive that, that we should be the one who so look forward to see the Lord. And he said, I will give thee, I will give Joseph, the crown of life. And lastly, the last verse, 11. He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt the second death. Oh, he that had an ear to hear, he that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church. This is our theme verse. And, and this verse uh, presented a decision you have, you have to make. You, know, you have heard it. You have heard what the Lord said. But you have to decide. You have to decide whether to obey and follow. Or to be the one who is the blessed. Uh, the one the Lord said that loves me. Or the one the Lord said that I will give you all of life. To be faithful unto death. And, and the word overcome. Again overcome appeared uh, in these seven letters seven times the word overcome in fact the letter is is written to all the overcomers but we are the overcomers or nothing should stop us from following the lord jesus christ nothing should stop us from serving the lord we are the overcomer every one of us you know, remember that the letters are written to all overcomers by his grace we will overcome by his grace by his strength we will overcome. And lastly, second death. Or we, we know about the first death that we all have to go through. And then there's a second death. And the, the verse says that he that overcometh shall not be hurt the second death. Or we will not, we will not be touched. We will not have to experience the second death. So what a reward. You know, what a reward. Okay, I think this is the last 
the team verse, he that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto him. A quick conclusion, uh, three things that I wish we take away. Uh, be sure that the Lord say, I know thy works. It should bring comfort. It should bring encouragement for every faithful believer. Fear none, be thou faithful unto death. It's an order, it's a charge given to all the believers, or especially the church in Smyrna. When the, when the believers, the suffering shame, saints uh, hear this, uh, they are given the encouragement to press forward because the, the command is clear. And lastly, I will give thee a crown of life. Or we should all look forward to the day that we, met, we meet the Lord and to receive this commendation from Him. He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto him. This, this phrase, this verse is, is to every one of us. You hear, you understand. You know, he that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto him. Okay, the last part. Actually, this, the, the program say that you, we have time all together to 11 o'clock. So we have a little bit of time. Uh, we are designed to do some discussion. Uh, the discussion is split into your small group. Uh, if you can help to arrange your group together uh, into a circle sitting, you know, uh, feel free to move the chair later. And I have three questions for you to consider. Huh? Three questions for you to consider. In this short letter to the suffering saints, saints in uh, Smyrna, God revealed his own character. Uh, you can talk about God's character, uh, discuss what you learn about God, in this letter to Smyrna. Or you can talk about the application, you know, with this awareness and understanding of God's character, you know, how will it direct your Christian walk? Knowing God is this and this and this, how would this strengthen you, you know, to move as a Christian in your Christian walk? And lastly, you can share your personal takeaway or in this uh, lesson, or yesterday lesson, uh, Ephesus, what is your personal takeaway from uh, uh, the two lessons? Also, in your own small group, you can do your own sharing. When we hear one another, when we learn from one another, that there, there can be some rich learning among ourselves. Okay, uh, so you, you, will, you, can, you can go ahead and divide yourself into six groups. Uh, wow, it's a, big, it's a big area. If I may suggest, group one, two, three. Then four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, and six. Sometimes. Then we can form a circle and we can discuss. Oh, yeah. Yeah. if it's a suggestion, take it as a command. <laughs> That's a good one. Next time when pastor suggests, you know what it means. Okay, we, you, we can uh, break out. Uh, maybe we just close with a word of prayer huh? and then, then we do the breakout and discussion. And, and also af after the discussion, if you have some rep, and to share with us what is your discussion, what is your takeaway. Okay, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, once again for this uh, great privilege, Lord, that the church can come together to have this camp and to examine uh, your words uh, through these uh, four simple verses uh, to the suffering saints in uh, Smyrna, Lord. You have revealed to us uh, your character, your love for your people. Lord, we pray that uh, with this uh, awareness, Lord, indeed, uh, you are able to uh, give us the second wing, Lord, that we can continue to walk faithfully for your own glory. Lord, we commit the rest of the time unto your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Don't touch the wire. <laughs>